Thank you. So today I'm going to talk to you about mental illness and the social cure. Now, to begin with, I would like you to consider this quote from someone who's currently suffering from depression. So depression is the constant <coughs> feeling of being numb, being numb to emotions, being numb to life. You wake up in the morning just to go to bed again. Days aren't really days, they're just annoying obstacles that need to be faced. Now, for the one in five of you who've experienced this, you'll understand this quote all too well. And you'll also understand how your world can be changed by just one person coming to you, offering you their hand and saying, it's okay, I'm gonna help you, you're gonna get through this. And indeed, you don't need to have experienced anything as um, severe as this to understand how other people can help you. We've all had experiences where we're feeling a bit down, that person we're head over heels about has split up with us, or we're about to give a rather scary talk to several hundred people. <laughs> so regardless of which, which of these situations you've been in, you'll understand, hopefully anyway, how much of a difference it can make to you just having those people around you who care about you and having that support from them. Now, this is what we're advocating. We're advocating the social cure. So this offers an alternative to the current methods of treatment of mental illness, which tend to focus on um, rather individualistic factors, um, individual risk factors, rather than taking into, con um, taking into account the wider social context and the people around us or the people who aren't around us. So what we're saying is that taking into account those people around us and the, the things that are happening in our life can make a really big difference. And this can offer an, an, an alternative to, um, at the moment, fairly costly, fairly resource intensive, and often hard to attain, and sometimes fairly unsuccessful ways of treating mental illness. So the theory on which the social cure is based is not a new one. Humans are social animals. We've evolved to be in groups. And um, like many other species, early hunter-gatherers live together for foraging, for hunting, and um, also for protection from predators. Now, um, as well as for survival, humans have also psychologically evolved to be in groups. So um, as well as, as, well as um, working together for, for basic um, survival, we actually choose to work together. So we choose to help each other, and we choose to support each other. Now, unlike our nearest um, living relative, the great ape, which cooperate, they cooperate together um, for food and rewards when they need to, human children will actually choose to work together. They will actively um, want to engage with each other. And it's this desire and this, um, this ability that led to the development of communities and led to societies as they are today. Now, this makes it obvious that if you are isolated, you're both psychologically and physically vulnerable. Basically, from birth, even, it's considered that, that newborns, even um, if they don't have anyone to attach to, if they don't have anyone to look after them, this can then lead them to develop psychological problems and problems with relationships for the rest of their lives. So there are long-term implications of this. And we can see in Maslow's original hierarchy of needs, um, love and belonging is one of four basic human needs that needs to be satisfied before someone can reach their full human potential or achieve self-actualization. Self now, these are considered deficiency needs, so this means that we need to have them. If not, we have big problems. So you can see here that love and belonging comes alongside things such as food, good health. So we can see that this is a really big issue that needs to be addressed. Isolation is a big problem. And it can specifically lead to a variety of mental health disorders, including schizophrenia, anxiety, and um, dementia. Now, in particular, it's a major risk factor for depression, with those who are isolated being at much higher risk of developing depression than those who are not. Um, it's also a major risk problem for, um, a major risk for the development of the disease. So those who suffer from depression are also more likely to become isolated. Um, one of the main symptoms is that you tend to withdraw from those around you. So this leads to a continuous cycle, um, which obviously has problems for relapse, it has problems for treatment, and it leads to more recurrence as well. So um, you can see that this is something that needs to be addressed, but at the moment we don't really know how to do this. And current treatments tend to be very individualistic. They tend to focus on personal therapy or medication. Now, therapy tends to include things um, like counselling, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is very successful for some people. However, it's quite hard to obtain access to. There are long waiting lists. 
and treatment tends to um, take quite a long time. It tends to go on for quite a few months, sometimes even years. So this is quite, can be quite hard for some people to maintain. When you look at medication, antidepressants have a very high dropout rate. Nearly 50% of people who take antidepressants end up stopping taking them. This is partly due to um, very unpleasant side effects, but also with difficulties getting the right medication. So clinicians are aware of the importance of social factors, but yet we still seem to be focusing on these fairly individual things. So why is this? One of the things is that, one of the problems is that um, there have been mixed results from social support interventions. At the moment, um, some have been positive, some have found positive effects of, of social support. However, some haven't found any effects at all, and some have actually been negative. There are also problems with definitions as well. So social relationships and social support can cover anything from whether you're in a relationship, how many friends you have, how many groups you're part of, whether you have any hobbies. Some people even consider how many social events you go to, so whether you go out with your friends, whether you go out with your colleagues, regardless if you spend the whole night arguing with them about the bill. So here is the problem that we have. We know that social factors are important, but we don't know how to define them. So this makes it very difficult to know how to prescribe. Um, you know, what do we do to improve, um, to, to use this, to utilize social factors to improve people's well-being? So this is where we come along. We're a group of social psychologists based in the social identity tradition. Um, and we've developed a, a large body of evidence from a variety of different cultures, different countries, and using different populations as well. And this has shown that the extent to which you identify with groups does indeed have benefits for your, your emotional well-being. And this is what we've entitled the social cure. So the idea here is that what matters is not just having contact with groups, it's the extent to which you identify with them. So it's the extent to which they matter to you, you have a good relationship with people in them, you feel you belong, and you feel that they'll support you if you need it. Now, this shows as well the difference between just turning up to your work night out, regardless if you spend the time quibbling about your bill, and actually choosing to go because you really like your work colleagues and you feel you have you this connection with them. Um, in this case, you can see how spending time with people you really enjoy, you have fun, you have a few drinks, um, would be beneficial for you. But if you spend the whole time sitting next to the, the woman across the office who you argue with all the time, this is probably not going to make you feel great and probably just going to result in, in raised blood pressure. So here the important thing is that you have to feel that these people are important to you. It's a subjective aspect rather than just belonging to the group that matters. So, this is beneficial to the extent that just having this sense of belonging itself, feeling that you have people who support you, um, will make you feel better in yourself. It will improve your sense of belonging, improve your sense of self-esteem, give you meaning in life, give you a sense of purpose. This, in turn, obviously makes you feel a bit better about yourself. It makes you feel more positive, which, in turn, also reduces negative feelings. It also makes you feel that you're more able to cope with any stressful situations that arise and stress in turn can lead to lots of negative outcomes. So being able to buffer this effect um, can definitely make a huge, huge impact on your well-being. So this is what we found. We found that identification with a variety of groups, including your family, your colleagues, your friends, um, even care home residents, um, your religion, this can all have an impact on mental well-being. So this includes anxiety, stress, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, self-esteem, so a variety of things as well as just depression. Um, and this has been found in a variety of populations as well. So even from, from teenagers right up to um, elderly people. We also have looked at several um, people, several populations who are suffering from illness, so um, people suffering from MS and acquired brain injury. Now, it's particularly important, the sense of identification for the, these more vulnerable groups, because if people are ill as they get older, they tend to lose their support groups anyway. So in this case, identification with the people that you do have is particularly important. And indeed, we found that actually the more group identifications you have, the better your well-being will be, the less depressed you'll be. So here we can see that those who identify with no groups, nearly 50% of them are depressed. Now, in turn, if you identify with one group, just, just one, one group that you feel connected to, this will reduce 
how likely you are to have depression, um, down to about 17%. So you can see the drop here. Now, this decreases as we go on. So the more <coughs> groups you identify with, the less likely you are to be depressed. So those who identify with two groups, only around 5%. And then this starts to level off at around about three or four groups, where it goes down to about 2%. So here you can see that the biggest difference is between those who have no groups, so those who are totally isolated, they've got no one in their lives, give them one group, get them to identify with one group, and their risk of depression will drop hugely. Now this all sounds positive, it points in the right direction, but you might ask what are the practical implications of this. So our colleagues at the University of Queensland have developed a program called Groups for Health, which is run over several months. Um, it's basically a training program where they help people increase their identification with groups. So not only do they teach you how to, to become more connected with your existing groups, but it also helps you go out and try and um, join more groups and you know, help you build the connections with these people in your new groups. And I know we've spoken to a few people at the interactive sessions earlier about this, you know, when you think about this, it is quite hard to think about, oh, are there more groups I want to join? If so, you know, how, how do I build these relationships with people? So this is one of the things that they do in the, in the Health for Groups. They teach people how to build these connections, work on their relationships, and how to improve them. Now, what they found at the end of the program was that people did, indeed, um, identify with more groups. They also improved their identification with their existing groups. So the things that were meant to happen did happen. There were also subsequent um, increases in mental health symptoms as well. So people were less depressed, they felt less lonely, less anxious, and less isolated. And not only were these effects found at the end of the program, they were also found six months later. So there was a longitudinal effect as well. Um, and these results were only found a month or so ago. So it will be interesting to see whether they continue. We're, we're expecting them to. So based um, on the success of this, um, the participants themselves were asked, what did you think of the program? Did you feel it was beneficial? Now, they obviously had um, improvements in, in their mental well-being, but they also felt that it did help them, it did help teach them ways that they could connect with those groups and ways they could join these groups. Things that they just really, they possibly knew, but they'd never sort of reflected on before. Now, based on the success of this program, um, our colleagues have run, they've started to, to use this program with a group of homeless people in London. Um, so they're working with a charity at the moment um, who are hoping to, to reintegrate um, the homeless people back into society. So not only are they trying to improve health outcomes here, they're also working on helping people, um, again, focus on their identification, on ways to improve their groups and improve um, how they communicate with people and how they can, they can widen these social groups. So not only do we have the, the effects on their, their mental health, but we can also use this as a way to try and reintegrate them back into society. And this is one of the, one of the main benefits of the Health and Groups program, is that it offers a, a pretty cost-free alternative to, to medication, to um, using clinical help um, to improve mental health symptoms. So um, the program is very easy to run. It only needs a few trained professionals. You don't need any medical intervention. You don't need any doctors. You don't need um, medication. And this is particularly important for these kind of groups, stigmatized groups, vulnerable groups, who often have problems getting access to healthcare anyway. So this is one of the, the main things that we're trying to use this program for. Um, it also offers us a different way of looking at mental illness. So rather than looking at, at as an individual problem, um, in a society that is increasingly isolated um, and people feel increasingly vulnerable and increasingly focused on themselves, what we're trying to do is to get people to, to look outwards and think of the people surrounding them. So rather than just focusing on ourselves and ways to help ourselves, we're trying to get people to utilize their existing um, networks and think about how they can use this to improve their own well-being. And not only this, think about ways that they can actually try and help other people as well. So rather than just drawing on their groups, think about how they can help them too. So basically, the main, the main idea of the social cure is to bring people back to the idea of being social animals and ultimately bring us back to what makes us human. Thank you.